Russia's windows to Europe have been open for a very long time, and even in spite of all the evil that has tried to break through them over the centuries of our history, we have never really cocked them up. And let's not even talk about the last half century. The whole Russian economic life was directed to the West, or rather to European countries. However, there is nothing surprising in this. Geography and cultural and historical prerequisites did their job. But lately the draft has been felt too clearly. Even so, it wasn't us who closed the shutters, but they were slammed shut in the most unnatural way from the outside. Well, the 21st century is the most appropriate time to reconsider the reference points, especially since Russia has an absolutely unique geographical position being at the same time in Europe and Asia. With one end, we are in contact with the Western economic giant and the other with the Eastern one. And since the Western one is rapidly declining, why not look in the opposite direction? It is obvious that the natural civilizational decline of Europe has been superimposed on the multiple acceleration of this process, which was given to this process by the Americans, the most crony and loyal friends. We do not know how long the European economic miracle would have been floundering on cheap Russian resources and a huge available market gradually yielding in everything to Asian competitors, if not for the magic kick of the United States, which in a moment friendlily got rid of Europe's dependence, severed all ties, sometimes even physically, which had been built up over decades. Now Europeans are absolutely independent of Russia, a little dependent on the United States, but on the whole completely free and happy. Bumber's eloquent February article Germany's days as a northern power industry are coming to an end is a vivid confirmation of this. The data that energy consumption in Europe will drop by 15 to 20 percent by the end of 2023 also illustrate the fading process as well. These are the figures mentioned by Boris Kovalchuk, head of Interrao, at a meeting with President Vladimir Putin, and they are a direct confirmation of the decline in industrial production. The reports that the legendary European automobile industry is gradually losing its own market to Chinese manufacturers are also being thrown up by the pan-European scandal. And it is primarily about the very green electric cars. A woman with a German name and surname Ursula von der Lager, which is unsound to the Russian ear, was ruined in the fall. However, there is nothing to be surprised about, because according to R.I. Novosti, in 2023, China will produce twice as many cars as the entire European Union and the United Kingdom combined, almost 21 million units. Why not? When the country has 437 factories working for the benefit of the auto industry, that's almost four times more than the EU, 80, and the UK, 36 combined. Added to all this is the constant declaration of big brothers from the ocean, who, for example, regularly demand from the German auto giant Volkswagen to shut down production in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region of China because the evil and terrible communists there mercilessly oppressed the Uyghurs, or even forced them to assemble the people's car for the Chinese for free. And even though no inspection has ever found any evidence of forced labor, the Americans really want the German car company to lose a profitable part of its business, and at the same time a stable supply of components to factories in Europe. What to say about the chemical industry of the Garden of Eden, which is completely dependent on imports of hydrocarbon raw materials to ensure the production and generation of electricity. Nuclear power is also in decline. The only hope left is the invigorating Atlantic breeze and the generous Mediterranean sun. But the nuance is that the market for solar panels and wind turbines has also been taken over by China. And India has suddenly taken over the EU market for petroleum products, sharply taking second place in 2023, second only to another eastern giant, Saudi Arabia. In short, Something is rotten in the beautiful garden of Josipo Borelli, and the Fourth Reich represented by the European Union is clearly no longer the same. Against this background, the military operation and the subsequent unilateral severing of ties with Europe only served as a powerful catalyst for our country to make a global turn to the east. In the eyes of many, this U-turn occurred very abruptly, dynamically, and painfully, without proper preparation. Of course, this process, which is only at the very beginning, is criticized from different sides. Well, some of the comments on this are certainly not unfounded, and for many members of the Russian elite, what has happened has come as a surprise. Not all business was ready for it. But can we say that the same is true of Russia's top leadership? Was there a strategic vision of the coming changes, and was anything done for them? Deeds speak better than words. Therefore, it is worth looking at what projects have been implemented by our country in this direction over the last 20 years to make sure that the window to the east was cut long before the Europeans filed for divorce at the behest of the omnipotent daddy in the star-spangled cylinder. ESBO, the Eastern Siberia Pacific Ocean Trunk Oil Pipeline, is a grandiose infrastructure system with a length of 4,741 kilometers. But, despite all the grandiosity, few ordinary people know about its existence and functioning. Meanwhile, this construction is not a legacy of the Soviet Union, 
nor is it the result of emergency and hasty actions after the introduction of the first sanctions in 2014. We take data from the official website of Transneft, which is the operator of this system, and read. In May 2003, the Russian government approved Russia's energy strategy for the period up to 2020, providing, among other things, for diversification of the markets for consumption and surplus of Russian hydrocarbons with the development of a promising direction of oil transportation to the Russian Far East and to the countries of the Asia-Pacific region. On October 18, 2004, the president of Russia instructed the Russian government to ensure that the decision on the construction of the Taisha Pacific Ocean oil pipeline system is made with due regard for Russia's long-term strategic interests. It turns out that our president guessed about something at the very beginning of his rule. Nowadays, there are cues for ESPO oil, which means ESPO in Russian, and India and China are jostling for its place. Vostokny Cosmodrome Russia's new space harbor is located in the Amur region in the Far East. The decision to build a large-scale complex from scratch was made by the president back in 2007. To date, the construction and development of the Cosmodrome and related infrastructure is actively continuing. For example, a large modern airport is under construction. But what has already been built is also admirable. Suffice it to say that the area of the space complex is 700 square kilometers. This is the Tsiolkovsky Cosmodrome, several launch complexes for different types of launch vehicles, a unified technical complex where rockets are assembled and refueled, a grandiose structure with an area of 45,000 square meters and a height of 37 meters, and all this in the middle of the remote far eastern taiga. It was here that North Korean leader Kim Jong-un was given a tour in September last year. Gas Pipelines Over the last decades Russia has been actively developing its gas transportation system, but by no means only for trade with the light skies, as is commonly believed in liberal circles. We have already mentioned in our time that our country consumes most of the produced gas on its own and exports only the surplus. The Sakhalinka Barovsk Vladivostok gas pipeline is a good proof of this. Opened back in 2011, it supplies gas to all the regions it passes through. Now most of the Far East CHPPs and thermal power plants run on environmentally friendly and inexpensive natural gas. Another grandiose project is the famous power of Siberia gas pipeline, which can be called a symbol of the turnaround from the European market to the East. Gazprom's Eastern Gas Supply Program, which is unbelievable in its scale, is currently underway. The idea of connecting Russia's unified gas transportation system with the isolated system in the east of the country is at the heart of this program, thus creating a gas transportation supergiant from the Baltic and Black Seas to the Pacific Ocean. Chemical industry. While Europe's chemical production is gradually dying out on the slow fire of sanctioned self-restrictions, Russia is only gaining momentum in this extremely promising industry. The first swallow is the polymer spike in the Siberian town of Tobolsk Zapsibneftikim company Sibir, which is one of the world's largest oil and gas chemical complexes, which began operations in 2019 and continues to expand to this day. But let's move eastward to the aforementioned Amur region. There, Gazprom is completing the largest Amur gas processing plant on the planet, Sibir. And next to it, Sibir together with China's Sinapec is building the Amur gas chemical complex, which will produce millions of tons of polyethylene, polypropylene, and other products. However, Giant corporations are not the only ones implementing such projects in the Russian East. For example, in the Irkutsk region, the local Irkutsk oil company INK is also building a huge polymer plant in the town of Askuti. Meanwhile, Vladivostok has opened the world's largest helium hub, a logistics center for servicing helium containers, and in Nakaka they are building a plant to produce fertilizers from natural gas. By the way, SSC Zvezda the Zvezda Shipbuilding Complex, whose construction near Vladivostok began in 2009, is the largest shipyard in Russia. The shipyard builds powerful oil tankers for Rosneft State Corporation. They make supplies here. It is envisaged to build an icebreaker of Leader Project. The plant has a number of unique engineering facilities, such as the giant crane, Goliath, and the country's largest, Dry Dock. Modernization of BM and Transib. When we speak about these great railways, we immediately think that our heroic ancestors laid the capital road to the east, but now it is time to improve, expand, and modernize it. Taking into account the fact that the World Factory China is located near our borders, we have a unique opportunity to get a lot of goods by a more reliable, faster, and cheaper way, by rail, while the rest of the world depends on sea transportation. A great deal has already been done in the process of the planned work. A new Baikal Tunnel 6,682 meters long has been built, a new bridge across the Zaya River, a transport and logistics complex in Zabaikalsk has been opened, and so on. We have named only a small part of the projects that Russia has been implementing in the East all these years but even this is enough to realize that we have been preparing for the European Demartian advance. But the most important thing is that we are actively preparing for the future, 
because Europe seems to have no place in it anymore.